Hi everybody, this is Rahul with the Alternative Investors Hangout, and today we have a special name, a special guest. His name is Charles Goyette. He's the author of the book The Dollar Meltdown, which is praised by guys like Ron Paul and Peter Schiff, so you would know that this is a great book. He has also written this new book. It's called Red and Blue and Broke All Over. Thanks for coming on, Charles. Rahul, it's great to speak with you. All right, so let's look at Europe. We have high interest rates exploding in all of these pig countries, and now it's happening in Italy. What do you think is going to happen? Will the euro break up later this year, or will they continue to prop up the banksters? Yeah, it's game over. It's it's literally game over in one form or another, and it can wind down. It can end, uh, you know, more abruptly or or less abruptly. They can continue to try to, uh, you know, string it out and uh, um, paper it over. But you you notice with each new announcement of each new solution. Every time they, uh, they, they design a solution, somebody's going to ride to the rescue of the European crisis and so on. There is less and less substance to it each time. I mean, originally, you know, we, we heard, well, it's Germany's going to ride to the rescue of uh, Greece. Germany's going to backstop uh, Greece. But all of a sudden, you know, who's going to backstop Italy? Oh, China? Do you remember when somebody floated, I believe, first on the pages of the Wall Street Journal that somebody was – that, that China was prepared to backstop Italy. Hello, has anybody looked at the Chinese problem itself? Uh, and, and, and China is uh, pretty much up to its eyeballs right now, backstopping the U.S. Treasury. So each time they come up with a new program, there's less and less substance to it. But the markets seem to buy it. You know, the stock market reacts. The, the uh, you know the uh, the the uh, the commentators on uh, on market TV, they oh it's great you know things have been solved. The leading story in the newscast: a solution has been advanced for the European crisis. Nonsense. There is no solution, and it's going to end all. It's all going to end very very badly. So, do you expect all these countries to go back to their original currencies, like the Greeks? I mean, the Greeks going back to the drachma? Yeah, it's going to have to happen. There's going to be some sort of decentralization of. Uh, of, of currencies, it's you know it's simply not going to happen that uh, you know the uh, the the people of Greece are going to continue to uh, you know tax themselves and work so that they could support uh, social conditions and the people in Germany are going to tax themselves and work so that they could support social situations or social conditions in uh, in Greece. I mean it's just an untenable situation. It's not going to last, and and so ultimately yes, they are all going to have to go back to their local currencies. So do you think in the short run Bernanke is going to engage in QE3 or QE3.5, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, and I actually think that they're they're more or less engaged in, in something like that now. I mean, already, you know, the monetary base uh, has had, you know, one burst after another. If you look at it today, I suppose it's about you – know, now think about this. The, the, the adjusted monetary base in this country when uh, uh, the mortgage meltdown hit in 2008 was $800 billion. It's now about $2.8 trillion dollars so i mean there's been this massive creation of uh, money by the uh, by the federal reserve and then surreptitiously they participate in it with dollar swap agreements with the uh, uh with europe and so on so yeah i think that there's a lot of this going on look under the circumstances of the united states the largest debtor in the world the largest debtor in the world and we're able to borrow in troubled times we're able to borrow money for 10 years at less than uh, less than 2% somebody has to be buying those bonds uh to keep those interest rates that low and of course one of the entities buying those bonds is uh the, is the Federal Reserve the Federal Reserve has actually become one of the largest now bondholders of US treasuries uh sur- having surpassed Japan and China yeah that sounds crazy yeah it's but- pathetic <laughs> All right, turning gears, let's look at the situation in the Mideast. Iran keeps on talking about blocking the Strait of Hormuz because of the sanctions that are going to come about. So if the Iranians do end up blocking the Strait, is this going to lead to a banking crisis like in 2008? If you have oil go up to, let's say, $200, $300 a barrel, the housing market collapses. And if the housing market collapses, then the megabanks are going to be in trouble. What's your take? Yeah, everybody, everybody's going to be in trouble. It's a very, very dangerous situation. It's a, it's a tinderbox in the region, and prices, as you point of oil, are going to go very, very high. You know, most of the guesses I see um, from people that haven't given this a lot of thought are that oil will, will effectively double up to $200 a barrel. I don't think they're paying attention. You know, during the, uh, the Arab oil embargo of 1973, there was actually no, uh, no diminishment 
of oil supplies to the world. Just because there was an embargo didn't mean that the same amount of oil production was floating out in the global economy. Um, and as a matter of fact, oil imports into the United States under those circumstances, under those circumstances actually increased. But uh, at, uh, in, over the course of uh, 1973 and 1974, oil prices quadrupled. And now we're talking about uh, the Strait of Hormuz, the closing of the Strait of Hormuz. So in my view, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's much more than a double, and it's much more than a triple, and it's very, very destructive for the economy. And I see these neocon warmongers. I saw one the other day say, oh, Iran, Iran can't close the Strait of Hormuz for more than a day. You know, we are yada yada, the big giants. You know, we walk, uh, we walk loudly and we carry a big stick. They close it, but it won't bother us and so on and so forth. These people have no real world experience if the hostilities get underway in the Persian Gulf and through the Strait of Hormuz, and if they succeed in closing the Strait of Hormuz, even for a day, can you imagine, can you imagine the multinational corporations that own those oil tankers willing to risk the assets of their stockholders and their corporate futures by floating those oil tankers through those troubled waters? Or how about the insurance companies, the companies that insure those tankers, letting them, allowing them with their insurance in place, not having lapsed, allowing them to sail through difficult waters because, oh, a bunch of neocon warmongers in the United States say that Iran can't close the strait for more than a day. It's nonsense, and it cripples. It's the, you know, it's the end of, uh, uh, of industrial uh, civilization for a uh, time that will be measured in more, more, than, uh, more than a day, but uh, certainly will, will be depression-worthy for weeks, if not months, and perhaps years. All right. Speaking of neocons, why do you see these guys, let's say on Fox, like Dick Morris, Bill O'Reilly, and even the guys on the left, like Rachel Maddow, like Hammer Ron Paul, I mean, guys like him, what's the deal with them? They bash yeah. gold all the time and the yeah. gold standard. Well, you, you look at somebody like Dick Morris, what is he? He's a creature of the state. He's a, he, he feeds on the state. It's the machinations, it's the intrigue, it's the lies of the state that provide him his... his his livelihood. It's the quest for power that is his specialty. And he'll, you know, serve any master that, uh, that will pay him. But he likes to slip in there and he, he you know, likes to, uh, get involved in the dark surreptitious dealings of people dealing with your future and dealing away American prosperity to acquire more power for himself. So they are lovers of the state. They love the estate. And, uh, of course, the, uh, the growth of the state that they champion is at the expense of the American people. But, uh, it, you know, it pads their individual payrolls, their own corporate business and their, you know, their TV appearances and their book sales and so on and so forth. That's his, the growth of the state is his livelihood. And uh, so Ron Paul represents an existential threat to these schemers, plotters, and uh, manipulators that uh, are parasites on the productive people of the country. All right. Speaking of Ron Paul again, guys like you talk about a currency crisis, and I also read your book, The Dollar Met Meltdown. Mm -hmm. However, there are few Austrian school guys pretty much agree with us on a lot of issues, but except the topic of inflation versus deflation, they say that we're going to have deflation. Some of these guys like Vox Day that I interviewed. So why won't we have a repeat of the 1930s and let's say have a deflationary depression? Why will this be an inflationary depression in your opinion? Well, we I mean, we've already had deflation. You know, we, we have these two giant forces, uh, uh, central bank monetary creation and uh, the deflationary results of the uh, last bubble popping. You know, we have massive deflation in this country, we have massive deflation in the dot-com bubble uh, not too many years ago. We have massive deflation in real estate. I mean, we're, we have, you know, massive deflation in the, li in the uh, lifestyle and income levels of the American, American family. There's no question that there are deflationary forces out there, and to say that there are not is... Um, you know, is a little bit foolish, and it's trying to deny the evidence. The question isn't isn't that. The question is, what is the uh, what do the monetary authorities do in the face of deflation? What did they do? What did they do in the in the face of uh, uh, the deflation of the American real estate economy? They pumped it up the money supply. They created. Uh, they cr tried to. They tried to inflate the last bubble. Now I'll tell you, Rahul, when I was a kid, when I was a child. I wouldn't have thought that I could, you know, take my bicycle to the gas station, blow up the rear tire by inflating it too much, have a big explosion, <laughs> blow up the rear tire, and fix the problem by pumping more air into it. You know, you, 
you can't inflate the last bubble, but that's been the mission of these morons, uh, you know, since since the bubble popped. So when I tell you that the, the adjusted monetary base is two point eight trillion dollars, that's that is the activity of the Federal Reserve. They're only the only arrow that they have in their quiver is uh, is money printing. So yes, there's certainly deflationary things in the economy. Every bubble ends in a bust. But the question is, what do they do with the currency that they have made us by law dependent on using? And the answer is, they debauch the currency. They they print you know more of more of uh, the currency. They create more money and credit in response to the uh, in response to the uh, popping of the bubble. So yeah, I mean everybody's right. Everybody's right about inflation. Everybody's right about deflation. But it's just a question of how the kabuki dance between the two elements uh, unfolds. The, que- the question, though, I think is even even larger than that. What does what does any of this do for the American people? I mean, did TARP do anything to ease the debt crisis in this country? No. No. Did it, did it do anything for housing? No. Did it do anything for unemployment? No. How about how about Wall Street? Did it do anything for Wall Street? Yeah, it sure as hell did. So you kind of know that the Federal Reserve is the creation of the money center banks, created it to do their bidding, and it continues to do so. So if you'd like to plot into the future what will happen next, you have to understand what the motives are of the people who created the institution that has its hand on uh, on the money printing levers, right? Right. Yep. Are you talking about the creature from Jekyll Island? I think that would be the one. <laughs> All right. Before you go, may you explain a little bit about your book and how people can follow your work in general? Yeah, um, I'm about to uh, launch a new uh, a new project. I, I'm uh, not announcing it today, but I have something uh, something coming that will be very big, and they'll be able to follow that at uh, charlesgoyette.com. The dollar meltdown is uh, is written for people so that they can protect themselves and their family from just the kind of machinations and manipulation, the currency uh, uh, the, the 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 currency manipulations that we have talked about in our short conversation. And you know, the subtitle of the dollar meltdown is surviving the impending currency crisis with gold, oil, and other unconventional investments. If you look at the year just ended, um, I mean, the Dow might have done, I don't know, 5%. Um, The Standard & Poor's Index uncannily ended up almost exactly flat with no gain. What were the big big, uh, performers in 2011? Gold and oil. That's the subtitle of my book. And it hasn't even begun to get going in full gear now. So I mean we are in the very early stages of uh, of uh, the dollar meltdown, and uh, then I have a new book coming out in the middle of March called, as you mentioned, Red and Blue and Broke All Over, Restoring America's Free Economy. And I and I thought since in the dollar meltdown I had told people how they can protect themselves and their their families from the calamity that the uh, you know that this 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 foolish economic policy of the uh, Keynesian left and the Keynesian right. Uh, all these years, these generations. Um, so I've, I've designed the dollar meltdown to help people protect themselves and their family from the inevitable consequences of this economic madness. But I thought you know, I thought I ought to write a book, Rahul, about if the American people did wake up and they decided they wanted to restore American prosperity, how could they do it? And so I've written the dollar. I've written uh, red and blue and broke all over, which is uh, intentionally ambiguous, right? I mean, it's a uh, it's the country. It's red and blue is is bankrupt, and the political parties that got us into this mess, the red party and the blue party, they are equally uh, morally bankrupt and intellectually uh, empty themselves. So you know, the real answer to the problem is is um, turning our back on the policy prescriptions of the Republicans and Democrats that got us into this mess. And uh, but for somebody like Ron Paul, there's nobody else on the uh, national stage, no elected figure on the national stage that really has the vaguest clue of how we got into this or how we can get out of it. Yep, very true. All right, thanks for coming on, Charles. Rahul, great to speak with you.